All right, from before. Riemann sums involved what shape? Rectangles. Rectangles. How many? Okay. Uh, for approximation, it was a finite number. If you wanted perfect, get the exact but infinite, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then we looked a little bit at this formula last time. So remember, this was the height or length. Oh yeah. And the width. Or it's just that general form. This was just summing up the rectangles. So remember, f of whatever was the height, so something like this. I'll make a rectangle on the x-axis. Let's say that's 2 and 5, so delta x would be 3. And the height would either be f of 2 or f of 5, depending if you're going left or right. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so this was the width or the base. And this represented the height, left or right, or whatever. Okay with that. Summing them all up. And this is actually a representation of an infinite Riemann. Because it says the limit as delta x approaches zero. So right now, in this case, I've got delta x is three. But if delta x approaches zero, that makes this rectangle that wide. So you end up with an infinite number of rectangles in there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is what we, even though you don't see an infinity, this is what you would consider an infinite Riemann sum because the width or base is approaching that zero there, creating that many rectangles. Okay. Sum, we're summing them up. One of the applications of a definite integral is area. One of the applications. So the definite integral is equal to this infinite Riemann sum. Now we call this a definite integral. Think back to what we've already done. We've already done this where there were no numbers there. We just integrated. We found that original function. Okay. Called that an indefinite integral. That's why we had the plus C. If I have values, that's called a definite integral because I'm talking about within a definite region. Makes sense to everyone? Okay, now let's kind of apply some geometry here. I'm going to say find the area. And we can do this because it's a geometric shape. And we'll look at the different shapes that we have. So let's go the integral from 2 to 8 of 5 dx. So this definite integral is representing that infinite Riemann sum. So we're talking about finding the area under the curve. Let's look at the shape first off. If I were to graph 5, that would be a horizontal line at 5. Would you agree with that? Well, I only want to know about it between 2 and 8. So between 2 and 8. Okay, what shape do we have? We got a rectangle. It's one large rectangle. Okay. So I've got this horizontal line at 5. I'm only looking at it between 2 and 8. It's defined between 2 and 8, that definite integral. Shape of has a rectangle. Area of a rectangle. Length times width. So this would be, what, 6 times Sorry. 5. 3. Look right. 2 to 8 would be 6 units. So that'd be that base or length, or it depends on how you want to look at it, it doesn't matter. And that height or length or width would be the five units right here. So we'd say that this integral equals 30. So the nice thing is if we can think of some old geometric shapes and their basic area formulas, we can work with some of these different things. Let's go integral from one to three. 
3x dx. So the first thing would be to graph 3x, and let's see what geometric shape we actually have. 3x would be a line, right? Yeah. Okay. So if I were to put 1 in, I get 1, 3, right? 0. 0.13. If I put 3 in, I get 9. Oh, what is that? Does that look correct there? Yeah. What's shape? A trapezoid. Trapezoid. Do you remember how to find area of a trapezoid? I have a base trapezoid. No, so that's, a triangle. that's a triangle. Here we go. Almost. One and a half height times the sum of the bases. Now, trapezoid is not one of those that's the most common ones that you would remember, but let's look at it this way. Couldn't you split this between a triangle and a rectangle? Yes. And then add the two together, you get the same thing, right? Which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to get the, tra the trapezoid formula up here, though, because we're going to be using that formula again towards the end of the unit. Right, so it's going to come back again. But you, of course, could do triangle and a rectangle, add them together. So my base is here. Let's see, one half. High would be two. Is that delta x? All right. Bases are the two parallel pieces, so you'd have 3 and 9. And that would give me a 12. Seven. <laughs> Where does 7 come from? Are you good on 12? <laughs> Fifth. Let's go with integral two to let's go two to four absolute value x minus three. What's the absolute value graph look like? A V shape. All right. So, do you remember what the three does to it? Moves it to the right. Moves it to the right. Three units. So we get that V shape. Move to the right. If you forget that, you could always plot points. Right. Nothing's going to change on that. So let's take a look at the sketch. Let's see. Shift it to the right. All right. So there's three. So if I substitute a two. I would get a positive one. And if I substitute a four, I still get a positive one. Both positive ones because we have absolute value there. Now let's look at our two shapes. Both triangles, right? So we could do each triangle individually and then just add the two triangles together. So one half base times height, I'm just gonna write plus one half base times height because I'm looking at two separate triangles, even though in this case they are the same size. So we've got one half, one times one, plus one half, one times one. If we combine those, what's that equal? One. one. So this definite integral is equal to one. Right, so we're using some old geometric stuff. Now representing it using a definite integral, which is also a representation of the infinite Riemann sum. 
So you've got a lot of basic things tying together here. I mean, the only thing new is this definite integral part, but it's not totally new because we'd already seen the integral symbol before. Let's get a different shape up here. Let's go integral negative three to three, square root nine minus x squared dx. Any idea what that geometric shape would be? What? Be a line. Not a line. <laughs> Maybe a curve. What kind of curve, though? Hey, what if I wrote it like this? What if I said y equaled the square root 9 minus x squared? How would you get rid of the square root? Squared. Squared? All right, so... Does that help at all? You're right to think, parabola, because you see a square, but it's not because they're both squared. Yeah, they're both squared, so it wouldn't be a parabola. Square root, parabola? Does this help? Oh, it's a circle. A circle. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Let me bring that X over. Okay, now let's think about this. Okay, this is a circle. All right, where's the center? Zero, zero, zero. Radius was three. Does that sound familiar? Center zero, zero, radius three. It's off a while back. All right. Now. Is a circle a function? No. no, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Okay, But when you're doing the square root, you only have part of the circle. Because when you take the square root, it should be plus or minus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I only did the plus. So I only want the top side of the circle. So the shape is a semicircle. It's half the circle. So the positive part would be the top half of the circle. The negative part would be the bottom half. Make the circle. Okay. So we have the positive. Okay, let's put negative 3 in. What's negative 3 squared? 9. Nine. So that's going to give us 0, right? We're over here at negative 3, 0. And if I substitute 3 in, I'm going to get the same thing. Yes. If I put 0 in, I'll get 3. But then again, we said the radius was 3. So instead of going all the way around, we just have this top piece, top half of the semicircle. <laughs> Pretend that looks like a nice, perfect semicircle. Don't laugh till you look at yours. Yeah, no. yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now it's still a geometric shape. How do you find the area of a circle? Pi r squared. So how would you find the area of a semicircle? One and a half pi r squared. So maybe not, the circle was a common geometric formula. I know a semicircle probably was not, okay? but it's pretty simple to transition from the full circle to half of it. Right? Radius is 3. Let's see, we're going to have 1 half pi 3 squared, which would just be 9 pi over 2, or I'm fine with a decimal form. Okay, calculator out and got a decimal, but we can also leave it with the pi in there. That wouldn't change anything for that piece. Are you okay with that? 
in. So for the integral, you're just going backwards from the derivative. So we're just trying to get to the original equation. Well, right now I'm looking for area, though. Okay. I'm not getting that original equation because I'm looking for area. Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about that original equation next time. Okay. Okay. Right now I'm just kind of looking at that area piece. Okay. Okay. Now, some properties of definite integrals. You're going to have a couple of homework questions regarding this. I want you to take a look at them and kind of work with the properties. First off, properties, the integral from A to B of f of x dx. So just some generic definite integral. Equals negative the integral from b to a of f of x dx. Now we're going to look at some of these different properties as we move through the next few sections. But what I just want you to look at today is, hey, if I flip the limits, you know, if this was 2 to 5, and then I make it 5 to 2, it negates it. Now let's think of why. Well, 2 to 5 left to right. Think of a number line, right? Two to five, left to right. Wait a minute, five to two, just went backwards. That's what's negating it. Are you okay with that? Okay. Second property, and we kind of worked a little bit with this one. The integral from, let's see, I'll write it like this. A to B of f of x dx could equal the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. It doesn't really matter what the letters are. I mean, I know alphabetically c doesn't come between a and b. Okay? But we're saying if there's some value in the middle where we're splitting up the integral, we can add the two together to get the whole. We did that right here. So we're looking from 2 to 4, but notice on our geometric shapes, we did 2 to 3, the first one. And then we did 3 to 4 for the second one, added them together to get the whole. That's what it's referring to. So the sum of the pieces equals the whole. Here they all is. Okay. Now the general form of the property does show up with a C. I think it might look better like this. C, B, B, C, just because B is between A and C, but it really doesn't matter what the letters are, okay? We're just saying the pieces, out of the pieces, you would get the whole, and we had an example of that right here. Okay? The pieces do not always have to be the same size. If I change this guy to, say, a seven. It's still a V-shape shifted over three units. It didn't change the graph. But instead of at four, we're over here at seven. And if I put seven in, I would get four. So we're up here. Is that piece? It's still a triangle, isn't it? It's not changing that. I can still add the two triangles together to get the whole. So if I went by the property, Here's my first triangle from 2 to 3. My second triangle from 3 to 7. Give me my entire function. So in this case, if I changed it, uh, <coughs> I wouldn't affect the first one. Let's see, this base would be 4. That would be 4. So go 3 to 7 is 4 units. And that was 7 comma 4. So what's that? 8, 4. So five would be then total. Still summing up the pieces there. Are you okay with that? All right. Let's get to our assignment here. 